firstly from us as the Firecats team to all you senior leaders, um, thank you so much for being a part of this. It's really, really appreciated. Um, so we're going to start with introductions. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is TJ. I'm a Firecats coordinator and I have been involved with the brigade for six years, but been working with them for two. Um, I'm going to pass on to Group Commander Pete Gustafson to introduce yourself. Could you just say um, how long you've been working with the Brigade for and maybe what leadership is to you or what you think a good quality should be for a leader to possess? Okay, so yeah, I'm Pete Gustafson, as you say, Group Commander from the Fire Brigade. Uh, I'm in the Hazmat team. I head up the Hazmat team. Uh, 26 years now in the London Fire Brigade, so still got a few more to go, uh, unlike some other people in the, uh, the group chat, who I'm sure will mention it. Um, what makes a good, a good leader? Um, I think a good leader is somebody who can inspire um, people to follow you and to trust you and to have that, that integrity um, that people are willing to follow. You know, you can... You can stand and you can bark orders left, right and centre, but unless the person is actually willing to, to follow you, you're always going to be on an uphill battle. So I would say if you've got that integrity to um, inspire people to want to follow you, that's, I would say, is the, is the primary aim. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Group Commander Pete Gustafson. Um, if I could hand over now to uh, v v Vicky Lowry. Hello, my name is Vicky Lowry. I'm the Deputy Head of Community Safety. Uh, I've been in the Brigade for 20 years now, um, doing all sorts of roles. Um, and I would say a big thing about leadership is you've got to have drive and passion for what you do. You've got to know what your goal is and you've got to have a really good, diverse team around you that also know what your what their goal is so you can all work together towards a common goal. And you've really got to drive and motivate your team to be able to get there. Fantastic. And uh, Group Commander Matt Cook. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Matt Cook. I'm a Group Commander and the Head of Leadership Development in the Cultural Change Team. And I'm in my 20th year in the fire service. I think the most important thing for a leader is to show humility. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that leadership is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So I think our role as leaders is to create more leaders, not more followers. So I think showing that element of humility and actually the people that you lead are not there to serve you, you're there to serve them, I think is probably the most important thing for me around leadership. Fantastic. Uh, and finally, uh, North East Area DAC, Alan Briggs. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Alan Perez, Deputy Assistant Commissioner uh, for North East Operations. Currently in my 30th year, I'm due to retire um, in the autumn, so looking forward to that. Um, so over the uh, 30 years, leadership, uh, really important, and I value uh, strong leaders, uh, you know, hold them in high regard. So you're, you need to be approachable, sympathetic, uh, empower others, uh, encourage growth in the individual so they can you know reach their full potential um you've got to be measured and calm um you've got to mentor coach mediate it's a full package of different skill sets that we all naturally possess but just build upon them to help others uh, grow and develop thank you fantastic thank you and some brilliant insights there from um different ranking officers within the brigade and also um, to point out, you know, we've got operational people here amongst us. We've also got non-operational jobs um, in the fire brigade. And I know, Vicky Larry, you're obviously deputy head of community safety, and that's a non-operational role. What would you say you would consider yourself to be in terms of leadership? What kind of leader would you say you are? I would say democratic, but also visionary. I'm always looking at the big picture. I'm always trying to drive us forward and, and make us better. Um, and I think um, you've got to bring people with you when you're on that journey. So, you know, democratic in that we work together as a team, my leadership team work together to drive things forward. But also I like to be a big picture person. I don't like to do the detail. So you've got to have people around you that can do that detail for you so that you can really focus on looking ahead. Fantastic. And in, interestingly, you mentioned people there. And actually, even though we have non-operational roles and operational roles, actually, we all work with people. and you, you all manage and oversee groups of people. 
Um, Group Commander Peter Gustafton, what would you say, what, what leader would you say you are? Um, oh, I'm probably a, a sort of more of a coaching type. Um, I don't have a massive uh, number of people who respond or report directly to me. Um, I do have the, the nickname of the mad scientist because of the, the hazmat side. But people come to me for advice, people come to me for information um, and go out to stations, I will go out to crews, etc., and, and give that, um, that input and give that sort of training uh, view. So, yeah, I would definitely say more of a, you know, more of that code. Uh, there's yeah, yeah. sort of two different people in two different roles, uh, an operational role and a non-operational role, what kind of leaders they perceive themselves to be. Um, uh, Dak Alan Perez, what would you say, um, why did you decide to strive for leadership or a leadership position in such an organisation like London Fire Brigade? Well, my first early um, experiences, um, obviously driving fire appliances, being part of a crew on the back of a fire engine, um, in days gone by, I, I saw a whole raft of uh, different leaders with different strengths and weaknesses. Um, it gave me time to self-reflect, looking at how those leaders commanded uh, men and women at the time. So, you, as you've mentioned, there's two types of leadership, especially in the operational and non-operational role. So, you'll have um, a leadership style in terms of running an area like I do or a department. Um, and fire stations and there was also a leadership style for commanding an operational incident so there'll be an authority because it's risk critical environment and then there'll be the softer set of skills in a fire station environment or meeting firefighters and the public or my fire and rescue teams so from my own driver and motivator to become a leader was I was driving an individual um, many years ago um, asked my advice on uh, an on an incident and what what I would do and um, at the time I thought you know it, I didn't find that question challenging and I thought well, that seems quite easy and I thought you know I'm going to give it a try and that was my drive for that obviously I took some ribbing uh, as you do in some of these things I'm going to be a, going for promotion and everyone giggles um, and I did and I to be honest I've never, I've never ever looked back I've really enjoyed my time and meeting all the different people I've met so my motivator really was somebody else and I thought I could do that I could achieve that and I did thank Superb, you amazing thank you for sharing your story there as well and it's, in, it's interesting that every leader has a story and every leader learns along the way um, so my question next is for Group Commander Matt Cook um, I know that you're involved obviously heavily in the center, LFB Centre for Leadership what would advice would you give for someone who's aspiring to become a leader in their chosen profession? Because uh, we might have people watching this who actually not necessarily have the heart to join the fire brigade as such, but just in leadership in general, what advice might you give to them um, for them being to be an aspiring leader? Yeah, thank you, TJ. Um, I think the biggest advice I'd give would be to um, never give up, really. I think always believe in yourself. Life is full of potholes and setbacks, and the key is to, is to not to beat yourself up when things go wrong, but to ask yourself, what have I learned from that experience? How can I pay it forward? Um, it's very easy when, you know, when life throws you a curveball and you kind of, you know, you, 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 have a, a, you, know, you, you go through challenges, and I think the most important thing is how resilient you are as a leader. And that's not necessarily mean that you're not gonna go through hardship or you're gonna go through difficult times or setbacks. Actually, it's that resilience, that, that kind of word resilio, the ability to spring back from challenges. And I think no matter what, it's believe in yourself. And when you do go through those challenging times and that adversity is to stop and spring back. And I think the biggest thing I've learned over the years is actually learn to rest, not quit. So just keep going, never give up on your goals, never give up on your dreams. And no matter what, you will achieve it. Fantastic. Brilliant piece of advice. Uh, and Group Commander Peter Stafford, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just looking around the, uh, the group here, um, I would suspect that probably every, every person in here who's got to a position that they are at the moment probably never did that 
at very easy steps, probably at, at points throughout their career, they failed um, in assessments, etc. They may not have been able to get that first step. And exactly as Matt says, it's that it's that courage and that confidence in yourself to not give up, to learn from those um, those failings, uh, and then to build on that and to move forward. Um, I would say, you know, if you ask around the brigade, you probably find that. No one's, you know, gone all the way through their, their career without having those knockbacks. And it's having that confidence to just keep moving forward. Fantastic. And thank you for, for adding that piece there. And, and Vicky Lowry, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, please. I just wanted to say, I think that, that belief in yourself and having confidence in yourself is really important. Because if you don't, mm -hmm. no one else will. So you've got to believe in yourself to inspire that confidence that other people can have in you to support you as a leader as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. TJ, for yes. TJ, could I add something on that, please? Yeah, I, and I just picking up on everybody's um, comments there. Really key is um, obviously when you start your leadership journey, be true to yourself. Don't change to fit the mold. Be the same person you start off to be. Yes, you have to adapt as you get, gain more responsibility, but don't change yourself. Be that person that started the journey to when you exit. It's really uh, key to keep your integrity and your professionalism uh, throughout your leadership um, journey as others have uh, mentioned so don't fit the mold be yourself and don't fit the mold and adapt be yourself thank you fantastic thank you for sharing you know, something that stuck with me when i was a cadet um, one of my instructors said to me once was are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer and actually um strange question but actually do you control your environment or are you controlled by the environment around you um, and i think obviously with operational um, leads in the room you know when you would turn up into an incident you can easily get flustered at that incident because sometimes of the severity of it um but is it that environment that changes you or do you stay the same with your integral um beliefs and your integralness to the brigade as well and what we have to uphold um, and lead in such a manner where you keep everyone calm and you've, some, you've touched on that as well. So thank you for sharing that, it was really brilliant. Um, and that brings us to, towards the end of our discussion points here. Um, some of the points that we wanted to discuss with us and sort of talk about, and it's been fantastic hearing what you've brought into this. Um, we're now gonna move on to a few questions that were actually sent in by some of our cadets and volunteers through our social media groups. Um, so if you've sent the question in, thank you very much. If it doesn't get answered in this one, we do endeavour to answer all your questions, okay? So hopefully, if this goes well, another series will come out and we'll be able to answer those questions in that as well. But please, um, don't lose heart if your question hasn't been answered. We will endeavour to answer that at some point. Um, so the first question here, I'm going to direct to Group Commander Peter Gustafsson. Um, and it's quite a simple question, really. How did your career progress and where did it all start? Wow, okay. Um, if I can cast my memory back that far. Um, <laughs> so, uh, before I even joined the Fire Brigade, uh, I always had a very keen interest in, in science. I used to always work in laboratories, three to four laboratories before I joined the Fire Brigade. So, that's where my chemistry background came from. And I remember coming into the Fire Brigade uh, and being interviewed. Um, and talking about my my skills and my qualifications and the interviewer said to me you'd make a fantastic hazmat officer which I had absolutely no idea what the person meant um, and lo and behold 26 years later I was in charge of the team um, that he was suggesting but uh, I joined always worked in the in the northeast so started off at Walthamstow fire station which I know has got a good uh, a good cadet unit uh, went from Walthamstow to Ilford to Hainault, to Hornchurch, to Shoreditch, back to Hornchurch, um, and then eventually uh, ended up at headquarters. Um, so yeah, so as I say, uh, moved up through the ranks, uh, getting to headquarters as a, as a station officer, uh, and then been up there, and always been in hazmat now, as I say, for 13, 13 years, and progressed through the ranks uh, with that. Fantastic. Brilliant to see there, actually. What's really interesting is previous careers um, have actually come into play in this career. And I think that's sometimes on young people specifically that we work with in cadets. They're so pressured at the age of 18 to decide what their life is going to be. 
Um, and they have this, this whole pressure on them. So, oh my gosh, I must decide what I'm going to study at uni because that's going to be the beginning and end all of me um, for the rest of my life. And I think, you know, really interesting there that sometimes experience in, in a field can actually bring you more experience into to another field if that makes sense you bring what you've learned into another field and you use that um to really sort of pull the car along in your in your job there so a fantastic example there uh, group one Pete Stafson, of previous roles coming into the play in a dream role that you might have once dreamed about you know um being younger some people love dreaming about firefighters and police officers and all these different roles and jobs um but thank you for sharing that was a fantastic journey uh, next question is um for um group commander matt cook uh, Matt Cook, what has been your most memorable uh, moment in the brigade? Um, oh, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, there's been so many amazing moments. Um, it's really difficult to choose one in particular. Um, yeah, you know, 20 years in the fire service, it's been a privilege actually. So there's so many times when I could talk about amazing moments where whether it be in the operational context or whether it be working with control colleagues or FRS colleagues you know the camaraderie that, that comes from being in the fire service is just one amazing moment I think but if I had to put it down to one specific example I think it would be back in 2003 so we got a was it um, High Town Fire Station at the time in Hampshire Fire Rescue Service and I was a firefighter we got a knock on the door from a lady that um, just just came to the station. And at the time, I didn't recognise her. She was asking for the green watch, which was our own watch. And then I realised that she was a woman that we had rescued from a road traffic collision about a year before. And she had come to the station. I mean, she was quite badly hurt at the time. And she came to the station just to, just to see us, just to say thank you for helping her. And I remember that being probably the most privileged and proudest moment of my career. Um, we worked with the police, the ambulance service, uh, an unseen doctor that come in a helicopter at the time. And I think it was just feeling part of that immense team that had supported that lady to go for a really difficult time in her life and then to what was uh, a full recovery. And it's not very often from an operational context you get that kind of closure on an instant. So that's stuck with me for my, for my whole life, actually. And that was probably one of the most you know, poignant moments of my career. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And I think each of us in our, in our roles, in some sense, have really impacted other people's lives. And I think that's one thing that um, definitely I take joy in, in my, in my role, and I know you might as well, is actually knowing that your job, when you get up and go to work, or at the moment, get up and, and stay indoors, or for the operational ones, obviously, still being a key worker and going outside, um, is being there and knowing that your job, your your efforts are really affecting other people's lives. And that's fantastic. It can be really, really encouraging for us to take away from this. Um, my next sorry, question. Yeah, oh, sorry, can I, yeah. can I, sorry, can I just add to that? I think it's also the fact that you never do it as an individual. It's that team, that collective effort. It's never one person. We're, we're all great. And, you know, the whole collective team is what is what delivers those outcomes. It's never one individual. I think that's something that, you know, it's always stuck with me in my career. And that's a yeah, fantastic point there uh, to add on, Group Commander. Um, like, next question is for our Deputy Assistant Commissioner, Al Perez. Being our most um, senior ranking member amongst us, um, is it hard being a senior officer? And what is the hardest thing that you've had to do whilst being in charge? So, um, yes, I, I hold quite a big bit of responsibility. So, I just over 1,300 staff uh, spread out across 108 watches um, so yeah it's a big job um, with it comes a lot of responsibility as you would imagine um, the hardest the hardest bit for me um, there's the nice bit with all the people because obviously people at the are at the heart of, of everything we do both internally and externally in community work and responding to operational incidents you know making someone's bad day a bit better with our professional training and expertise but the, the hardest bit for me, really, you, we, you know, join and we talk, I talked earlier about the pathway to leadership. I was a firefighter um, and worked my way to my current position. But the hardest and disappointing position, I don't, you know, I have to do it as part of my role, is when sadly I have to dismiss someone from the organisation. That's um, quite, that's very hard because obviously 
that severance at that point you know hearing like that would affect their life their family um so that's the not so nice um part of my job that i find um uh, the most difficult really because obviously it's you, i don't relish the fact that you have to deal with difficult situations complaints uh, and you know trying to resolve and mediate them for the best outcome for all uh, almost like a win-win position but sadly part of that comes the um hearings the conduct hearings where we have to sadly dismiss people and the impact from my decision making will have on them for the rest of their career and future roles and obviously the impact that i have on their loved ones and uh family so that would be that's my most difficult um part of my role i would say okay and thank you yeah thank you for sharing and being so honest there i think um you know sometimes we don't like to tackle those topics especially um when you're in charge of people it can be such a sensitive uh, topic to come in to being able to dismiss someone and having that responsibility wearing your shoulders um can be quite stressful sometimes actually um especially when dealing with people because there's emotions and there's other things that come into play so um thank you for being so honest and open there that, that um next one's coming to our, our deputy head of community safety uh, Mickey lowry what is your favorite part about working for the brigades i know we've spoken a bit there a bit about what's the hardest but what's your favorite part about working Oh, it's definitely the people. It's just like one big family. We're all working to make London safer in whatever roles we do. Um, and, you know, we're all driving towards the same goal and we're all supporting each other. Um, and it's a great place to work. I just love it. I wouldn't have stayed for 20 years if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. And I think that speaks for itself, you know, in, in amongst all of you here. You know, you've all worked, you've all worked for the brigade 20 years plus. I think that almost speaks for itself in such a what a great working environment the brigade creates and what a family feel actually and um, that you know we've, we've touched on some of you some of you have touched on your answers the brigade is uh, maybe some people don't see it as a job they almost see it as a bit of a, a bit of a hobby you enjoy what you do um, and that's something that um, we teach our cadets really is to do something you love because when you love you're passionate about it and when you're passionate you have a drive to be able to go out and do what you do every day um, so thank you for sharing that um, Ricky Lowry um this last sort of question here i'm going to ask you one more after this um drawing into a close now actually is what are some of the best workouts slash exercises to do to prepare for a firefighter application now I'm, I'm sure this came from one of our cadets um and i suppose this is best um sort of directed towards the operational um group commanders and depth system commissioners amongst us in terms of firefighter role is there anyone who would like to take this question on um, so that's what are the best workouts or exercises to do to prepare for a firefighter application? Okay, I'll start and I'm sure the others will join. <laughs> um, so obviously there's the online guidance that we've got um, on www.londonfire.gov.uk under our vacancies and becoming a firefighter so, or a FRS member of staff or a control staff. So there's a number of exercises there. It's not, all, it's not always about your physical uh, fitness, it's about your mental fitness and well-being. So we must um, also look at that and not negate that special part of our lives. Um, but what I, my advice, and it, again, everybody's different. So walking, running, aerobic exercise, whatever clears your head, hobbies, you know, interests you've got, collecting, whatever it is, if that works for you and makes you... Um, in your approach to applying to be a firefighter then that's what you've that's what you've got to do we're all individual we're all different but obviously key to this is the physical aspect of the role you've obviously got to be physically fit but there's loads of little pieces to the jigsaw that will make the whole person so that's where that's my contribution thank you and uh group commander for peter stassen yeah um so just going on from that um don't focus on any particular area. You know, you'll you'll get you'll get people who are coming in who've got you know sort of biceps you know to kill for, um, and but you know sort of no no stamina in the legs etc. It is it is a complete all round fitness. Um, so don't just focus on one area. You know, do the whole lot. Have a look at the you know as as. Uh, Alfred said, have a look at the website. You'll see the kind of things that you're going to get asked to do on your physical. Um, 
some of it will be things like having a head for heights. You know, it's, that's not something you necessarily can, can teach yourself, but you know, it's something you can identify in, in your own, in, in yourself as well. But one thing I would say is before you start doing too much exercise, you know, you know, take some advice, you know, you know, don't, don't go, suddenly go out and just think, you know, tomorrow I'm going to become a, I want to become a firefighter. I'm going to go out and run 15 miles, you know, do it in steps, build up that stamina. Superb, superb. Um, and before, yeah, Matt Cook. Um, so I used to be a, a watch fitness instructor actually, and <laughs> quite a few years ago. So I used to get this question asked quite a lot actually when um, people used to visit the station. Um, I think I think you've kind of already touched on it actually, particularly what you said, TJ. Is no matter what what you decide to do in terms of physical exercise, do something that you absolutely love. So. I love running. I love putting my trainers on. I love going out and running trails, doing long distances. It's good for your mental health. It's good for your physical health. But it's not about doing any one particular type of exercise. It's about doing something that you love and that you can be passionate about. And then the rest will sort yourself out. So again, go and look at the website, look at the specific areas that you need to be fit in. And then but mostly go out and just enjoy that fitness and, and, and make it part of your life. Superb. Thank you for sharing there and the operational perspective. That's fantastic. Um, just uh, in Vicky Lowry, just a question for you, because we have do, we do have cadets and do work with volunteers. So actually their desire isn't always to become an operational firefighter or become an operational senior member of staff. Um, we've got over 60 cadets and volunteers now that have joined the brigade in non-operational roles and operational roles. What would you say to someone who necessarily is seeking advice? Um, what, what advice would you give them for, if they're applying for an FRS form? What, could, what kind of is the best way to go about that and sort of train themselves up there? I would say coming in as, as, as I did, as an admin role, um, an FRSB as we call them, is that sort of the first block of, of the career pathway, um, is a really good start because there's so many different departments in the brigade. So you've got legal, finance, fire safety obviously is the best. Um, you know, we've got so many different places that you could work that actually joining as a B an FRSB is a good place to start because you can join and then you can go move across to different departments and then you can see what you like and what you're good at and then you can progress from there um, I'd say also if you are looking at applying for a job then um, speak to one of your fire cadet coordinators about um, getting asking one of the managers maybe for some support around interviewing skills or the kind of things that might come up because there are loads of people in the brigade that can help with that. Um, you need to kind of have an understanding of how the brigade works. Um, so definitely, you know, get in touch with someone who's already working for the brigade um, and meet with them and have a coffee and, and a chat about what it all looks like because the assessment centres are sometimes quite difficult and we have our own way of doing things. So, um, yeah, that's, that would be my advice. Superb and extremely helpful there. Um, for people, and I love how you unpack the fire brigade. When people think about the fire brigade, you actually hear the stereotypical red doors, fire engines, and actually there's there's a ton behind that um, that that it is needed in order to keep the brigade running. You know, you've got control as well, yeah. um, telephone handlers, all those kinds of jobs that come into play is absolutely fantastic. You know, we get cadets saying, "I love dogs. Well, why don't why not become a brigade dog handler?" You know, um, obviously an operational role there. Um, but it's all fantastic advice that you've given here. So I hope, I hope the people listening, you've taken away some notes um, from what's been said here, because this is fantastic stuff from the people themselves who are actually doing the jobs, not just doing the job, but managing the people who are doing the jobs as well. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Last question before um, we let you all go is just a little bit of a fun one, really. What, who, what a leader aspires you? Um, or is there a motto that you kind of live by? I think, you know, recently for me, um, I actually did a leadership course um, um, delivered by um, GC Matt Cook. Um, and one of the things I learned from there, and what kind of stuck with me, is actually to give control and create leaders rather than take control and attract followers. I think, you know, we live in a world where people really, really do sometimes like take demand and control. And actually, you do create and get into a habit of creating a group of followers. But actually, once you give people the tools to find the answers themselves, 
you start to unpack leadership for them. And sometimes people who would never have thought themselves as leaders start to step up to the plate. I'm going to hand over to Group Commander Pete Stassen first to just maybe give us a leader that inspires you or a motto that you kind of has helped you in your leadership style. Um, a leader who inspires me. Um, it, it sounds quite corny to always pick the, the top person, you know, the person at the top, but uh, our commissioner, Andy Rowe, um, I mean, I've, been, I've worked with Andy since he was my rank as a group commander. Um, and you, you could tell right from the start that the, um, he was he was destined for, for you know, the, the top job purely because of the way, exactly as we, as we spoke before about all those leadership skills, he just, um, he just personifies those perfectly. You know, always willing to listen, always willing to lead, you know, excellent head on his shoulders. Um, and if I could be a sort of a, a fraction of the officer he is, I'd be more than happy. Superb. And thank you for sharing, um, Group Commander Peter Stetson. Such a, a key point being a commissioner is such a tough role to take on. Um, but for us to aspire and look up to leaders such as that, especially in our own organisation, uh, is really, really admirable. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Group Commander Matt Cook. Yeah, I think um, one leader that I, I suppose I look up to the most was my, my first lead and firefighter, Robbie Burns. So he was just one of those people that you just would you know, you'd follow him anywhere. Um, he cared deeply about the service and the service that, that we delivered to the public. He'd always put the needs of the public and the needs of his team before anybody else's. And he also, also had a, a kind of inspiring way of believing in your abilities. And he'd always put you just to the point, like an elastic band, he'd always stretch you beyond your comfort zone to help you grow as a person, but not to the point where, where we ever felt out of that kind of that place of comfort. So I think that's one individual that's had a real impact on my life. And if I'm ever half the leader he is, then then I'll be I'll be doing okay. Superb. Thank you for sharing. And uh, penultimately, uh, Vicky Lowry. It's a tough question. I, I would say there's not one person that I would say is the person I aspire to. Um, but what I would say is I've worked for lots of different leaders with lots of different styles and you always take something away from those so you take the good bits and you kind of push away the bits that you're not sure about uh, and you and you take the good bits for yourself and you learn and you adapt and, and you try to aspire to be uh, those qualities that you see in your own leaders so and I would echo Pete in terms of he took my answer actually uh, in terms of Andy Rowan the commissioner Again, um, very inspiring person. When you see him speak, um, you know, you, you can tell he's a really good leader. So, yeah. Fantastic. And finally, to finish us off, um, Deputy Commissioner Alan Burris. Yeah, thank you, TJ. Yeah, so um, like has already been echoed, really, leadership is a blend of traits, um, some positive, some not so good. But I think we all pick up and hook up on the positive, you know, like to think the positive traits we see in individuals who we want to aspire to um yes i when i first met andy rowe many moons ago you can just tell there's something certain people uh, jump out there's something about them i've um and, and i know we've got the um talent team here at london fire Brigade. there's certain people that really do jump out and are different from others with with how they come across how um how they perform and just how they hold themselves um in terms of role models, um, so obviously, I've, as I just mentioned, I, I saw something in Andy. Andy's a very good speaker. He can bring people. He can bring people with him. He speaks with passion, enthusiasm, uh, and credibility. Um, person who, who I've worked worked for many years. He's uh, sadly retired now. Was um, Gary Reason. He was the director of safety and assurance. Um, I worked. Yeah, I worked with him when he was on the operational review team. So I've had this long. Sort of standing career with him, he's still obviously a friend of mine outside of the service. But um, if I just to mirror his standards, his behaviours, how the workforce, you know, viewed him, um, he, for me, he was a very, very credible role model. Thank you. So thank you all for joining uh, and hearing what all our senior leaders have had to say about leadership. We really hope you've taken away some really key points from this. Um, to help you progress in, in the leadership path that you choose um, for your future. 
So thank you for joining and choose, tune in next time for a bit more of Grill the Governor. See you later, guys. <laughs> Bye, bro. Bye. Bye.